group shared, Story Group has given me the tools to address and pursue healing in my life from issues that have really weighed me down. It's also a wonderful place to connect with others in an authentic way, share compassion, and care for one another. I'm very grateful for the honest, vulnerable, and safe space that was my group of storytellers. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in, I'd love for you to join us for the workshop. You can learn more and register for this upcoming Story Group seminar at pointers.com groups. Now, I want to invite you to attend Point Care Center's big fundraising event of the year called Taste of Carry on Thursday, September 22nd from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It's going to be an amazing night at Chatham Station, downtown Cary, with jazz and six amazing restaurants. Ray Steakhouse, Totopos, Maximilian's, Alverde, Teresa's Italian Cuisine, and Pro's Epicurean Market. And each guest will get a plate from each restaurant. And all the restaurants have donated all the food, which means if we can have 150 people purchase a ticket, we will raise over $10,000 to care for our community. You can find out more and register at pointcarecenter.com slash taste. I know that was a lot. So to keep up with all this and more, visit your campus news page and follow us on social media. And we hope you enjoyed the rest of the service. And uh, we are so excited that you are here. Um, we are starting a brand new series this morning, going through the book of Acts, which I am super, super excited for. But hey, let me uh, invite you to do something. Uh, I, I don't know if, you know, normally if you uh, grew up in church, your parents always told you to put your phones away. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to ask you to take your phones out real quick. So go ahead and take your phones out. And uh, we know that sometimes inviting people to church is, is hard, especially one-on-one, um, -on -one, right? Sometimes there's that intimidation factor face-to-face. -face. But what I want to invite you to do is to make a digital invitation. It's the first time we've done this, and this might become a thing that we do. So what you can do if you have Facebook, if you don't, you can get it and use it as a missionary. Um, but get Facebook, and if you go to post a status, you can check in. There's a button that says check in. And you put, it should find your location and say that you are here at Point Church Garner. All I want you to do is check in that you are here at Point Church Garner. If you want to go the extra mile, you can say something, um, like here with my church family, you know, whatever, hope you'll join us next week, something. But all you have to do is pull out your phone and, uh, and, and click that status update and then check in at Point Church. It's a really, really simple and easy way to, to make a digital invitation to let people know that we are here and that um, we are, are, are pointing people to Jesus each and every Sunday. So take a minute to do that um, while I make another couple of announcements. This is a cute phone, isn't it? This is actually my wife. So here, I'm going to hand this back. I don't have that much style uh, that she does. But hey, uh, like I said, we are jumping into the book of Acts this morning, and uh, we're going to be going through this incredible book over the next 12 weeks. Now, if you're a Bible nerd, you might be thinking, hey, there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. Like, what in the world? How are we going to go through all that in just 12 weeks? Well, here, I'm going to make a deal with you. So I'm going to tell you, we're not going to go through every single chapter every single week. What we're going to do is, uh, uh, from here, from the pulpit, myself, or we have some other guest speakers who are going to be joining us over these next 12 weeks, which I'm excited for you to hear from them. Um, but what we're going to do is, when we're here, we're going to kind of give a little bit of an overview of the, the passages of the chapters um, to give a little bit of context of wherever we are, and then we're going to hone in on a specific set of verses. So what I'm going to make a deal with you is that's what we're going to do. What I want to challenge you to do is start on your own by reading through the book of Acts. You see, if you've never developed the, the discipline of reading through Scripture, don't worry. This is a really, really easy on-ramp. Um, so Acts is 28 chapters. And if you took two to three chapters a week, which will probably take you about 10 minutes per chapter, maybe if you're a slow reader, 10 to 15 minutes, and you read through two to three chapters each week, you would be completely done with the book of Acts by the time we finish this series. Not only that, you would be able to fill in some of the gaps of things that we don't quite cover, maybe in as much detail as you would want. And so that gives you the us as a church the opportunity to read through this book together. Um, and it also hopefully will help us establish that discipline of Bible reading. Um, I know sometimes Sometimes we, we can talk with people who are 
maybe a little bit further along in the faith, and they'll say things like, well, I get up at 5.30 a.m. every morning and read my Bible. And it's like, holy cow, I am not there yet. I don't get up that early. Sometimes I do mine at the end of the day uh, before I go to bed. But if, if, you don't, if you don't have that rhythm established in your life, this is a really good way to start developing those healthy habits. And I believe you will experience the fruit from that in the weeks to come. So that's what I want to challenge you this week, though. It's easy. We are going through chapter 1, just the first 11 verses of chapter 1. And so uh, your assignment this week will be to read chapters 1 and 2, maybe even 3, if you're feeling a little ambitious. Um, but what I, what I want to do is I want to give us a little bit of a context to this book. So anytime that we're reading through Scripture, it is really helpful for us to know what is actually going on. A saying that I like to repeat is that Scripture wasn't written to us, it wasn't written to you, it wasn't written to me, but it was written for us. It was not written to us, but it was written for us, meaning that it is meant to be applied by us, the followers of Jesus, no matter whether that's 15 years after it was written, a hundred, a thousand, or a million years later, it is meant to be applied. But it was not written to us, which means that we need to understand the, the, the setting in which these books of the Bible were written if we're really going to be able to understand them rightly and get the most out of them. So what is this book? Well, this is actually part two of a, of a set of letters written by Luke, who, if you recall, also wrote the Gospel of Luke. You see, at the beginning of both of these letters, he writes to someone he calls the most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus was likely a name. It could have been a pseudonym, possibly for um, some scholars believe he, he may have been a, a Roman official that didn't want to give his real name and so had a... a, a a pseudonym. Theophilus means in the Greek, it means lover of God. Um, so somebody who, who loved God. So it could have been a real name or it could have been a pseudonym. We're not sure. But this person likely commissioned Luke to give this account. Um, and so what Luke here is doing is he wrote the gospel, the account of Jesus's life. And then part two of this is the, the expansion of the early church, which is really part of the continuation of Jesus' mission. So it's not a separation. It's not like, well, Jesus did things, these things, and then the church is over here. It's, uh, Luke is writing as one long continuation. He just put it in two parts, kind of like a lot of movies like to do today, right? Like Twilight Part 1 and Part 2 or The Hobbit Part 1, 2, and 3. That's kind of what Luke is doing. He's doing Part 1 and Part 2. And so the book of Acts is that Part 2 where it's picking up with the early church. Now, you might be wondering, who was Luke? Like, we, you know, we, we, we name our children Luke. My middle name's Luke. Um, what do we know about him? Well, his last name was Skywalker. And I'm just joking. That's a, that's a Star Wars joke. It's not Skywalker. That would be super cool. I, this is not in my notes, but when I was a kid, um, so my middle name's Luke. I, I used to ask my mom, why'd you name me Luke? And she, in the very beginning, was like, oh, we named you after Luke Skywalker. And I thought that was the coolest thing. Then I grew up, and she's like, no, we named you after the Gospel of Luke, which I guess is kind of cool, too. But anyway, um, the Luke's name, we don't know Luke's last name, but we do know a couple of things about him. Not a whole lot, but we know a couple of things. Number one, we know that he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, who uh, is, is figured very prominently in the book of Acts. Uh, we also know that he was a doctor. He was a physician. Possibly that may have been one of the reasons he traveled with Paul was to, to take care of him. Now, what do we know other than that? Well, we can likely deduce a few things. For instance, he was probably an educated man. Um, now, lest you think that you have to be an educated man or woman in order for God to use you, just remember, most of the disciples were uneducated laymen and laywomen, okay? So you don't have to be educated to be used in great ways uh, by the Lord. But Luke, in this case, was, was an educated man. You can see that in some of his writing styles. He was also um, somewhat of a historian. Um, see, the, the interesting thing is that when you look at the book of Acts, it's incredibly reliable. When you look at the people and the towns and the places that were visited, historians often remark how accurate the book of Acts is, especially in recent times. If you, if you go back about 100 years, people were, were tearing it apart saying, well, this isn't accurate, that's not. But in recent scholarship, they've discovered that a lot of what um, Luke has written actually happened. And I think that's an important point to remember because sometimes when we, we read through this book, it can feel so fantastical, right? Like it happened so long ago and like in, in a land, in a culture, which is just hard to wrap our minds around. But I think it's helpful when we take a moment and say, you know what, this is as much a work of history as it is a work um, of theology explaining who God is and what he came to do. I think that can be helpful to remember that, that what 
took place in Scripture, took place at a real time with real people in real places. Now, Luke also was sort of a theologian. He was writing to communicate something about God and about God's mission. And so where we pick up in the book of Acts is where um, uh, uh, Jesus is kind of giving his great commission. So, so Jesus ended, with, or Luke ended in the, in the gospel of Luke with the great commission, which is to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And now we kind of pick back up, but Luke adds a little bit more meat on those bones. So what I want to invite you to do is go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, Luke or <laughs> Luke, uh, Acts chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. The words are going to be up here on the screen. Uh, just let us know if you, um, uh, if you want a Bible. We'd love to show you our favorite Bible app so you can take God's Word with you wherever you go. But the words are also going to be up here on the screen. And in honor of God's Word, when we start a new series, one thing I like to do is I just li- like to invite us to stand um, in reverence for God's Word as we kick off this series. So Acts chapter 1, we are going to start by reading just the first three verses. So this is the Word of the Lord. Luke writes, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Those were the disciples. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So, we are going to, we're going to read some more, but I wanted to, I want to pause there. Um, So again, Luke is kind of recapping a little bit of what he ended with in his gospel, that that Jesus came and uh, and that he spent some time appearing to the disciples. Um, We have a few different accounts, if you look in John and and, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have some different accounts of what all went on in that 40 days, Um, but we don't get a whole lot of detail, because the important matter that the uh, writers of the Gospels were trying to get across is that L- Jesus rose again. And not only that, he rose again and he sent his disciples on a mission. But Luke does give us a little bit of detail that the other Gospel writers don't. Notice that at the very end, he said that Jesus, as he met with them over a period of 40 days, he taught them about what? The kingdom of God. If you're a highlighter or an underliner, I would mark that in your Bible. Why is that significant? Well, because if you look at the other Gospels, particularly in Matthew, you see, and and even in Luke, you see that when Jesus comes to preach, he comes to preach and proclaim the kingdom of God. And so uh, Jesus is really kind of picking back up where he left off, like he's preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God, and then he dies and he, he gets raised again, and then he does what? He starts preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. It was obviously a central message for him. It was important. And, and, I, and I think this is important to understand because I think what Luke is helping us to see is that what we're going to see in the book of Acts is the kingdom of God expanding. The kingdom of God expanding. Now, he goes on, Jesus goes on in verse 4 and 5. It says, while he, Jesus, was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for the Father's promise, what Jesus had promised them before his crucifixion. Which, Jesus said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with, uh, excuse me, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So, in other words, Jesus was promising the Holy Spirit to them. Right? So he was saying, listen, the one is coming. I told you that, that unless I leave, the Spirit won't come. So I must go so the Holy Spirit will come. And the Holy Spirit was the power by which these men and women would be able to, to spread the kingdom of God, spread the good news. And so then what's interesting is the apostles respond, or the disciples respond in verse 6. So, so when they had come together, then they asked him, Lord, so are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? I want to pause there. See, uh, true to fashion, true to the disciples' fashion, they, they were missing something. Like if you look in, in the, uh, the Gospels and you look at the disciples and their interaction with Jesus, one of the things that is a consistent theme is they don't get it. 
Like, I, as so I was, I was um, discipling a, a young man, and we were reading the Bible. We were reading the Gospel of Mark, and one of the things he said is he said, you know something about the disciples? They're goobers. And I said, that's a really good word for them. Like, they are total goobers. They just don't get it. They keep missing the mark. And still, even after Jesus rises from the dead, they ask a question which they should know the answer to. Lord, are, when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? See, they were still thinking in natural terms. They were still thinking with what Paul would later call the flesh, those natural things, those appetites, their own ambitions. Not with a heavenly mindset, thinking like, Jesus, when are you going to establish your kingdom here on earth and expand it geographically? You see, I think sometimes in our efforts to build the kingdom of God on earth, we end up building communities that look a lot more like the kingdom of earth than the kingdom of heaven. I think in our efforts to to go and make disciples of all nations, we start, rather than forming communities that reflect heaven, we create communities that reflect the earth. I mean, we, we look for leaders who are ambitious and charismatic, not leaders who are meek and humble. Uh, We want to mark a person's success by numbers rather than by faithfulness. And we want to win culture wars rather than win people to Christ, don't we? But the kingdom of God looks so much different. So what is the kingdom of God? We use it a lot, we read about it, what is it? The kingdom of God is not a territorial or national kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom filled with people from every race, every nationality, every tongue. It's not, it's not delineated by natural borders, by mountains or oceans or rivers. It's delineated by people who have submitted their hearts, submitted their lives to King Jesus. So something I, something I want you to understand, and I think this is important to remind ourselves of because we can forget it, It's just a simple point, is that you, as a follower of Jesus, you have a kingdom. You have a kingdom. Now, having a kingdom doesn't mean that you are the the Lord, you know, the king or queen of that kingdom, but what I mean is you have a kingdom that you belong to. Yes, you have a nationality. Yes, you have a citizenship here on earth, but more importantly, you have a citizenship in heaven. You know, what's interesting is before colonists imposed national boundaries, on the kingdoms of Vietnam and the kingdom of Laos, they had to come up with their own borders. And, and I read about the, the way that they did this was kind of interesting. Um, so what they did is uh, they, they needed to understand, because the two countries, the two kingdoms bumped up next to each other, they needed to know um, where one kingdom ended and the other began. And instead of using, again, like ge- geographical features like mountains or rivers or, and whatnot, they instead decided to do it by another means. So what they did is they decreed that people who ate long grains of rice and who built their houses on the ground, like on a firm foundation on the ground, and then decorated their houses with like Chinese dragons and other sorts of um, Chinese decorations, they were designated as people of the kingdom of Vietnam. And then on the other hand, people who ate uh, short grain rice and then built their houses up on stilts and then had decorations that had like uh, Indian serpents and stuff like that, um, they were designated as people belonging to the kingdom of Laos. So again, what's interesting is that the exact location of the person's house didn't really matter. That didn't determine which kingdom they belonged to. What determined what kingdom they belonged to was their, the cultural values that they exhibited. Right? What, what, what do you eat? What do you do? What's your house look like? That's what determined which kingdom they belonged to. And I think it's the same with us, that although we live in this world, We are part of the kingdom of God, which means that we live according to kingdom standards and values, that we submit to one Lord no matter where we are. I like the way one missionary put it several decades ago. He said that wherever God rules over the human heart as king, there is the kingdom of God established. So this isn't just another form of uh, imperialism or colonialism. Right? This isn't just like t- a mission to like, like, uh, put our culture on somebody else. You see, the kingdom of God isn't spread in the same way that earthly kingdoms are spread. It's spread by witnesses, not by soldiers. It's spread by people who proclaim a gospel of peace, not a message of war. It- it's accomplished by the work of God's Spirit, 
not through coercion and power and violence. This is the kingdom that we are called to be a part of. So now Jesus, correcting them, responds in verse 7. He responds to their question about restoring the kingdom of Israel. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is really important. So first thing, Jesus kind of dismisses what they say. I mean, not entirely. Like, he answers them, but he doesn't linger on it. He's like, listen, you guys don't need to worry about the time and the dates and all that when I come back. Like, I'm coming back. That's all you need to know. Right? So if anybody looks at you and tries to say, well, you know, the Hebrew letters look like this, and did you see in Revelation? So he's coming back March 31st or something like that. Be like, see ya, okay? Like, I'm going somewhere else. Like, like don't pay any attention to that. Okay, Jesus says, not for you to know. Don't worry about that. All you need to be focused on is your mission. So he moves on to something important and and tells them what they, and by extension us, need to do while we wait for the Lord's return. What he does is I think he gives us the how and the what. How we are to accomplish the mission and what that mission actually is. So Jesus said to the apostles that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Power. This, is some, this was a big deal. This was something special. Because in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon someone, it was very specific. It was a specific person at a specific time at a specific place. And not only that, but God's Spirit, if, if the person proved to be unfaithful, God could take His Spirit from him or her. But as followers of Jesus, the brand that we as believers Where is the Spirit? That's the seal that we have been adopted into a new kingdom, that we have been adopted into the family of God. And so Jesus is saying that soon, like, it's not just, like, according to God's, like, direction and plans that, like, you know, Bob's going to receive the Spirit for something specific and then for five years and he's going to take it away and send it to someone. Like, no, he's like, listen, if you surrender that, uh, and, and, and call upon the name of Jesus as Lord, you will get this Spirit. You will receive this power to accomplish my mission. But the thing is, is, is that power wasn't just for the early church. That wasn't just a message for them. He wasn't saying, you 12 disciples, or, or you, there's about uh, four or 500 early disciples um, that stuck with Jesus after his death. He wasn't just saying, you guys receive the Spirit. He's saying, everyone that calls on me as Lord will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So the second thing I want you to see is you have a power. You have a power. Again, if, you, if, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, the Spirit has come to rest in you. It's the fuel The Holy Spirit is the fuel by which we can experience the power of God in our life. And that power provides courage. It provides boldness. It gives us the ability to forgive other people, to not hold grudges. It gives us insight and ability and all those things. And so if you're you're sitting here today and you're unsure of how God wants to use you, like you're thinking, like, I'm not really sure. I'm not that gifted. Like, I'm not a good speaker. I can't sing. I don't like kids or like whatever. You're like, I don't know how God wants to use me. I want to reassure you with something. It is not about you. It is not about you. And it is not about your giftedness. The power of God's Spirit is not dependent on human ability. Like, that's why the Pharisees uh, and people during Jesus' day were so astonished when they looked at these people. And and we'll see later in the book of Acts, they're astonished at what they're able to do because they say, these are ordinary men and women. These are ordinary people, but yet they speak with authority. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit rests in them, and that Spirit is the same Spirit that rests in you. You have a power, and it is not dependent on you. So you can feel insecure about your own abilities all you want, but trust and be encouraged that God's willingness to use you is not based on your merit. It's not based on your ability. The reason I'm up here is not because I'm such a great speaker because I, like, whatever, like, practiced this and did all this. Like, yes, I did practice and all that, but I tell you, like, for so long, like, I was a stuttering, nervous mess. And the only reason I'm up here is because of the Holy Spirit in my life. And you know what? When God takes that, God won't take the Holy Spirit out of um, believers. That's what Scripture tells us. But if God were to take that away, 
don't expect anything good from me. And that's why when I come up here, my, my, my mindset is, all right, God, like, I want to rely on your spirit. I don't just want to, don't want to uh, use my natural ability to get through this, because if I do that, you guys aren't going to benefit from it. Like, you don't want to hear what Grace and Furlough has to say, because Grace and Furlough is not that smart. Grace and Furlough is not that clever. My goal is simply to be like a waiter. I heard one pastor say this, and I thought this was so good. Like, the waiter who uh, goes to the chef, okay, and gets the dish and comes and brings it to you, right? Because it's not about me. I didn't make that meal. I didn't put seasoning on it. I didn't choose what the course is. Like, I didn't do any of that. My goal is by the Spirit to just say, here, this is what God has said. And if I don't do that, feel free to call me out on that. But that's my goal. So you have that same power. That God's Spirit is the one who energizes and creates and restores you, illuminates your life, bestows gifts that you never knew existed. You've never had anybody invest in you like the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit didn't just, doesn't just empower you, doesn't just give you courage so that you can go to your boss and say, I deserve a raise. Maybe, I mean, maybe. Uh, but I don't think that was his intention. You see, he enables us, he empowers us to do something. That is to carry out his mission in this world. That's the third thing I want you to see, is that you have a mission. I just want to read Acts 1-8 again. He says this, Jesus again says, but you will receive power. You will receive power. Power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the mission. To, uh, the, the reach of the gospel, Jesus is saying, will go global, it'll go around the world. You know what's fascinating is the, uh, we take it for granted, I think, but um, the, the invention of, of cell towers, of internet, of things like that. I don't know if you know, the first commercial cell phone network in the entire world started where else but Tokyo, Japan. And uh, it started in 1979, and then in 1983, uh, the first cell phone network was established in the United States, in Chicago, and, um, and, and spread from there. Now, the way cell towers work, according to YouTube that I looked up, is... Uh, is they use electromagnetic waves. They send out this wave. And, uh, and of course, as it goes on, it, it, goes, it, it, it diminishes over time. But what, so what they do uh, is when they're establishing a cell tower, they usually look for a place that's unobstructed. And so usually that means up on a hill. If you live in the mountains, um, the, they're pretty clear to see. Like you're driving around and, you know, you just see this massive tower. And sometimes they try to be clever and they try to make it look like a tree. Have you ever seen those, those cell towers that look like trees? You know, like, that's the weirdest tree I've ever seen. Um, but that's what they do. They try to put it somewhere where it's not going to be obstructed by mountains or hills or, or whatever else. Actually, there was one town in uh, New England where they put it in a church steeple, um, which was kind of neat. I guess they didn't have any hills around there. But anyway, um, so that, that's what they do with cell towers. They put it somewhere high, somewhere unobstructed, and so it, it carries its signal across the land. See, I think the Great Commission works in much the same way. That if you look at that, those areas on a map, it's, it's like, like if you dropped a, a pebble in water and you saw it rippling out. Like, like Judea, or excuse me, Jerusalem was where they were at. Judea was their, was their nation. Samaria was the neighboring nation. And where did they say the gospel would go? To the ends of the earth. Like it, it wasn't going to be stopped or hindered by different cultures or different places or, 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 or mountain ranges or whatever. The gospel was going to go forth. And I think it's interesting how the next um, nation that it went to, at least in here, in this example, is Samaria, right? The, the hated enemy of the Jews. Half-breeds the Jews thought of them. And it says, look, 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 gospel is going to ring out like a cell phone tower. It's going to hit Jerusalem. It's going to hit Judea. It's even going to hit your hated native neighbors, and it's going to go to the end of the earth. That's our mission is to radiate the good news of Jesus wherever we go. And you know what? We're still benefiting from what the disciples started. Well, what Jesus started, but what the disciples carried out all those years ago. Here, fun fact, here in East Garner Middle School, right where you're sitting, plus or minus a few feet, we are 6,101 miles from Jerusalem. It's almost halfway around the world. I get that. Like where you are sitting 
is the ends of the earth. Like when, when Jesus was giving that to the disciples, like I'm sure when Peter and others were sitting there and they thought to the ends of the earth, like they couldn't even imagine what was here. They didn't even know what was here. Like you and I are at the ends of the earth. Isn't that incredible? But our mission is not yet done. Our, our job isn't done. There are still people who have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is a God who wants to bridge the chasm created by their own sin, that he longs to forgive them and change their life. There are still people who have not heard that message. That's why Paul, I think, wrote in Romans 10, 15, he says, uh, he, answering the question, and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? He says, that is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Like he's saying, how is anybody going to go to the ends of the earth unless you are sent? Like God's not just going to like write it in the sky. He's going to use you and he's going to use me. So get this, there are there are an estimated 4 million cell phone towers in, in the world, like 4 million. If you look on a map and all these dots, um, like it's crazy. They're everywhere. Now, maybe you're saying, no, they're not everywhere because I can go somewhere and there's no cell phone signal. But like they're all over the place, okay? Give me a break. They're, they're, there's a lot of them. And so what that means is that there's been approximately 270 cell towers installed every single day since their invention about 40 years ago. 270, and that is a lot of cell towers. But how much more do we need churches that will spread the good news, not to connect with people's phones, but to connect with their hearts? That's why we believe in church planting. It's not to build our own kingdom. Because if we're building our own kingdom, it won't last very long. Point Church Garner, who knows, may not be here forever. That's not the point. It's not about our brand. It's not about you know, how cool or aesthetically pleasing we can be uh, or our reputation. Um, you know, if, if God could remove this church for his own glory, we'd say do it. It's not about us. It's about him. And that, that, the spreading of the good news is not just something that's done on Sunday morning from the pulpit. It's not just something done by small group leaders. It's done in your neighborhoods, in your offices. It's done when you walk your dog, when you go to the grocery store, when you coach your son or daughter in li Little League or T-ball or soccer. It's done everywhere you are. God didn't say, go, go spread the gospel, go make disciples from the pulpit. He said, go and make disciples wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. You could even say to the very ends of the earth. Something else I want to point out is in this commission, um, the word witnesses is, or witness is used. Um, now, that word in the Greek is where we get our word for martyr from. Fun fact. Witnesses. See, in our, in our day, a witness is called to the stand usually to testify to something that they've seen, right? So if you saw a robbery, they may say, well, I call so-and-so to the stand as my witness. They're there to testify to something that they have seen. And so essentially, the apostles then were witnesses not to a crime, but to the most miraculous event in history the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They saw everything that happened with their own eyes, and now Jesus' expectation was that they would share that news with the world. They would be a witness of his resurrection, of his power, of life change to the world. Now, even though you and I were not witnesses in the same sense, we are witnesses to the power of God in our life. Like, if you have submitted to Jesus as Lord, you have experienced the power of God in your life, at least to some degree. So what this means is that everywhere you go, you are a, a living, breathing reflection of what you have witnessed. Wherever you go, you are a reflection of what you have witnessed. That's why the actions and behaviors of believers are so important. 
Because if we've truly experienced the forgiveness and, and, and the power of God in our life, that transforming power, our lives should be changed. Our values should be different. Our goals and our standards, our conduct, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, it should be uh, different. That doesn't mean we have to go into some, you know, wilderness somewhere and like eat crickets or something. You do you. I'm not going to do that. It's not, well, it doesn't mean that's what we have to do, but it does mean just kind of like that analogy I used of the two different kingdoms, of Vietnam and, and Laos. It means that the values and standards we have should look different because of what we have witnessed. When we share that good news with others, we're, we're doing nothing more than sharing something that we ourselves have experienced. Uh, and, and Rooted, so Rooted is one of those groups uh, that we are starting up this week. If you haven't signed up for that or a story group or you're not a part of a group, do it. Do it. Just do it like Nike. Uh, inserts are in your program, so plug for that. But in Rooted, uh, it's a 10-week um, experience that we go through. Toward the end of that, I think it's week nine, um, you write your own story. It, it tells you to um, like basically write out your testimony, and it gives you some prompts for how to do that. And sometimes we like to make sharing the gospel so complicated. At least I do. Like, I'm, a, I'm up here, like, preaching, and, and sometimes I'm like, okay, like, okay, what are all the points that I need to remember? And it's like, I make it way too complicated. I, I like, intimidate myself, and I know I'm not the only one. But you don't have to be intimidated because, you know, really what it is is just sharing what Jesus Christ has done in your own life. Like, you're just telling people. Like, I know in our day and age, it's like, don't impose your values on me. Listen, sometimes all you have to say is, like, can I share with you something that has changed my life? Or if somebody says, man, you're so nice. Thanks for bringing these brownies. You know, we just moved to the neighborhood. You know why I did that? It's because Jesus has changed my life. That's all you're doing. is You're sharing your story. Now Luke closes out this section, this, this passage of Scripture, verses 9 through 11. It says this. It says, after he, after Jesus had said this, he was taken up. As they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. He said, why, why are you, like, they're just, they're staring up at heaven. Isn't there an old saying, I think, this is not in my notes, otherwise I would know this, but, like, uh, isn't there an old saying about, like, chickens or turkeys that look up when it's raining and they, like, drown themselves? Somebody? Nobody? Nobody? It sounds familiar. Okay. Anyway, that's what they were doing. See what happens when I stray from my notes? Ah. Anyway. Look it up. I'm going to look it up, and I'll, I'll share it on Facebook or something. Anyway, so that's what they were doing. They were, they were staring up, and if it had been raining, they would have drowned. Um, they, they were looking up into heaven, and what's kind of ironic is that earlier in, their, in this um, passage that we were looking at, they were busy mentally, spiritually looking at the ground, right? They said, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Like it was very earthly focused. And now they're caught staring up into heaven, amazed, wondering, but I think it's funny because, you see, the angel said, listen, again, kind of like what Jesus said, don't worry about it. Like, don't, st you don't, don't, don't waste your time staring up in heaven. Jesus is going to come again. You don't know when. You don't need to worry about that. But just know he's going to come again. He's saying, don't, it's like he was saying, don't look down at the earth or, or stare aimlessly at heaven, but instead look forward because you have a mission to accomplish. You have a mission, so get to it. Church, it's time for us to get to work. And so my, my challenge to you today and every day is this, is to make Jesus famous. It's to make Jesus famous. And again, don't, don't worry about whether or not you feel capable because God is equipping you. He is investing you, in you. He is changing you. He is empowering you. You don't have to worry about, you know, whether or not I'm, I'm skilled enough. All you have to know is you have been called. You also don't have to look at what I do, look at what Chris Graham or any of these people up on stage or in Kid Point or whatever. Like, man, you can make Jesus famous 
in the unique way that God has wired and equipped you to. My wife did it for many years through art, sharing her testimony through art, connecting with people through art. Now she's working to be a fitness instructor so she can share Jesus with people. Like you can do that wherever you are, whatever your your giftings are, whatever your interests and hobbies are. Like you can do that. You love board games? Man, that can be a ministry. You love boats, you love cars, like you love collecting cards, like sports, whatever. You can leverage those things for the gospel. God has given you interests. He has wired you in a way and he is equipping you in a way to make his name famous. So do it. Do it. Remember, church, you have a kingdom, you have a mission, and you have a power. So now let's make Jesus famous together. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are king, you are Lord, you are majesty. And what a privilege it is, God, to be used by you. Uh, Lord, to know that we are not here as a speck of dust in this expansive universe, randomly given here with no value or purpose to find. But Lord, you have given us a, a, a mission. You have given us a purpose. And not only that, that you haven't left us high and dry, you have empowered us to accomplish it. God, you have empowered us to accomplish it. And Father, for anybody in here that um, maybe they just need to be reminded of that, Lord, I pray that your spirit would, would weigh on their heart in such a way that they, that they feel inspired, that they feel confidence, that they feel um, your presence, most importantly. Lord, and if there's anybody in here that, that maybe doesn't think that way, they, they say, you know what, I don't think I have entered that kingdom. I, don't, I, I still think I sit on the throne of my life as king and I have not made Jesus king. Lord, I pray that they would surrender and do that today. Father, for us who, maybe there's somebody on our mind, somebody who is far from God, Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities not just to talk at them, but to come alongside them and reflect your glory to those friends and families and coworkers and loved ones. God, to give us the strength and the perseverance that when life gets hard, we can rest because we know that we are adopted sons and daughters of the King. We have a kingdom. God, thank you for giving us a power and thank you for giving us a mission. May we carry it out faithfully. In Jesus, Jesus, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So now we're going to move into a time of response. This isn't just a part of the service that we plan, and so we're just sticking to a schedule. Like, this is a time for you to respond. Uh, It's not the only time, but it's a time that you can respond, and you can do that in a few ways. Uh, One, we take communion every week. It reminds us of the king who gave his life for us. Uh, Another way you can respond, you can respond by seeking prayer, either by praying yourself or by coming and speaking with myself or another elder. Uh, Myself's going to be be back there. Dan's going to be back there, another elder. Uh, We would love to pray with you. We would love that. But even if you just need to pray silently, like, you know, you can respond in the way you feel led. Another way we respond, we don't always talk about this as much, but we respond through generosity, through realizing that our money is not our own. It's kingdom money. And so you can respond by giving, giving in the buckets in the back or by going to pointchurch.com slash give but respond in some way. Maybe it's by saying, you know what, I really need to go talk with my coworker. I've been putting it off for far too long. But don't leave this moment today without making the decision to respond in some way. So I'm going to leave you to take communion. Um, Sometimes we take it corporately. Sometimes we take it by ourselves. Today I want to encourage you to take it by yourself or with the person who's sitting next to you as you meditate on what you've heard. If you're not a follower of Jesus, that's okay. Just sit back and and reflect on those things. Um, But if you are, uh, there is a communion cup. If you don't have one, the ushers have one for you. And when we take communion, we are reminded of the kingdom that we belong to. Jesus says he sat with his disciples. He held up a piece of bread. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He said, you take and eat in remembrance of me. And then he held up a cup. And he said, this represents my blood spilled, poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. When you eat the bread and you drink the cup, we remember that Jesus was the one who made a bridge. Jesus is the one who changed everything. And that he has called us to share that same good news with the world. So Point Church, I invite you to now respond as you feel led this morning.
If you guys can stand and just worship with us. remind you of a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, if this is your first time, we are, we are so glad that you're here. 
Uh, in fact, we want to give you a little gift. Uh, if you fill out that Connect card and you bring it to Sandy, she is standing by that big blue box, that big blue square in the lobby. We'd give, love to give you a $5 Chick-fil-A gift card just as a thank you uh, for joining us. I know uh, attending anywhere for the first time is kind of scary and intimidating, so we just want to say how much we appreciate you being here. Uh, make sure to do that. If, if you are interested in anything that you heard in the, in the announcements, if you're interested in the Taste of Carrie, joining a small group, uh, anything else, care center resources, um, you can mark that on the back of your Connect card um, as well. Uh, and you can drop that in the bucket. If you have any tithes or offerings, you can drop that in the bucket or go to pointchurch.com slash give. You can set up a reoccurring payment, uh, whatever you would like to do. I, I want to do one other thing before we leave. I'm going to ask for you guys to be seated for a second. Uh, in the vein of what we're doing, I thought this was very appropriate um, in God's sovereignty that he planned this out. Um, so today... This Sunday marks six months that we have been a church, um, which yes, pray, praise the Lord. Um, we we've seen we've seen six or excuse me, we've seen four people baptized. Uh, we've seen uh, just countless conversations of people that I mean, God is just changing their life. Things that wouldn't happen if God didn't bring us here in a time like this. And so, uh, for for you have been a part of this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I also want to thank those. So one of the things we do is we were planted out of Point Church Cary, our sister church. You've probably heard us talk about. And, and when they did that, in addition to sending people like who have come to, uh, for the long haul to make this church their home, they also sent some what we called six-month missionaries. These are people who for six months they came um, from Point Church Cary or maybe another church to help us um, get this off the ground. And so we have five different families um, who we want to recognize and celebrate, two of which are out of town. But if you're a six-month missionary, I just want to invite you to stand up. Um, go ahead, stand up, Tom and Rennie, Moss and Wayne. Can we just thank them? We talk about expanding the kingdom of God together and through your sacrifice and your generosity and your time and your effort, um, you've done that. Um, so thank you. Kisners, thank you. Um, there are some families that aren't here that we want to thank as well. Um, the Wallaces and the Walshes. Um, but seriously, because of what you have done, um, we've been able to point people to Jesus together. You may, you may be seated. I don't want to cause you to sin too long. Carol, thank you. Thank you. Um, because of what we've been able to do together, uh, we've, we've pointed so many more people to Jesus than we ever would have been able to without you. So, so thank you for that. And that's part of what it means to, to live on mission. You know, you don't have to go on a mission trip halfway around the world to point people to Jesus. You can do it in your backyard. You can do it in a neighboring town. And so I hope that their faithfulness inspires you. I hope it encourages you. Um, so some of them you'll see a little bit later. Um, some of them are, aren't necessarily going right back um, next Sunday. Some of them will be, but make sure you express, express your appreciation to them. We have a little gift we'd like to give to y'all. So again, you can see Sandy out back. Um, so uh, instead of uh, ending in the normal way we do with a benediction or something, I just want to pray over y'all, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So will you pray with me? Lord, it is an honor and a privilege to be your servants and Lord, for these six-month missionaries who have served alongside us, God, who have given of their time and their talents and their treasure, Lord, I pray that you would bless them for that. Lord, I know they didn't do it for the recognition. They didn't, they didn't do it for the resume points. Lord, they did it to be faithful because of what you have called them to do. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless them, give them rest. I know it's been a busy six months. And I pray, Lord, that in their stead, you would raise up laborers. You tell us in Luke 10, 2, to pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers. And so, Lord, we ask that you would provide the laborers. We know you can do it. We know you will. So, Lord, I pray your hand of blessing over them. May we continue to do what we've set out to do from the start, and that's point people to you. Lord, we love you so much. And, um, God, we just thank you for them. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, church, also next, sun, uh, next Sunday after church is our vision night. So uh, as a church, we're going to be coming together with Point Church Carry. So make sure you're there. Point Church Carry, just Google it. It's, not, it's like 15 minutes from here. Be there or be square. I'll see you next week. Go point people to Jesus. <laughs>